Well, good morning, everyone. Who Jesus is and what he came to do. And uh, we're going to see today that they preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and the gifts that were given to them. And so uh, when the Magi showed up uh, to see Jesus, you know, they didn't show up during the birth of Jesus. You know, we all have the, the little manger scene at our house or, or we've seen it. You know, we have baby Jesus, Mary, Joseph, angel on the roof. And we have some shepherds and sheep and cows. And we have some Magi with some gifts over here. And, and it's a nice, pretty scene, but it's inaccurate. Uh, because the Magi didn't show up at the birth scene. It was actually about two years later before they arrived on the scene. And so uh, if you think about this, uh, they brought gifts to a toddler. All right, now if you've ever had a toddler, um, be before I had kids, uh, I, I judged parents with toddlers. Uh, sometimes, you know, within myself, sometimes verbally, but, you know, before you have kids, you think, why can't they control their kid, right? What, what in the world? You go to Walmart and you hear that kid screaming over there. That's mine now, by the way. If, if you're ever at Walmart and you hear a kid scream, it's most likely mine. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you used to judge those people like, man, how, why can't they control their kids and all that stuff? And then God blessed me with four beautiful children. Um, I have a 13-year-old, I have a teenager now, 11-year-old, and I got two toddlers at home. I got a, a four- and a two-year-old at home. And so um, God is teaching me some lessons uh, through these kids. <laughs> but, but it, you know, we, a lot of times we'll judge people, you know, before then. But now it's like you go out in public, and, and, and I feel like they know this innately, that if I act up in public, my parents can't, like, immediately punish me like they want to. Uh, in that moment, and so I can kind of get away with some stuff when I uh, go in public. You know, I, my, my prayer is always that my kids act better when they're away from me than, than when they're around me. And, and you, know, we, you know, we hope we're raising kids that will do that. But, you know, sometimes when they're around you, I mean, my Lord. And so uh, to kind of tell a story on, uh, on myself, you know, one day we were, uh, I think Ella had a volleyball game that night, and we, were, uh, we, we hadn't eaten dinner yet, and so we were going to go home. But, you know, we didn't want to go home and cook anything, so let, let's just stop in at the Mexican joint and eat some food real quick. You know, you stop in the Mexican because it's quick, you know, it's easy, and it's good, right? And, and Right? It's good. It's good stuff. Oof. Give me some Mexican food any day, I mean, let me tell you. <laughs> anyway, and so when we get there, you know, there's a couple, you know, people in the store, and they kind of filter out. And, and we have the restaurant to ourselves uh, that night, and so... Uh, at the game, apparently Evan maybe he had some Skittles or something. He had a little bit of sugar in him, so he was a little bit extra that night. <clears throat> and so, you know, he wouldn't sit in a seat. You know, he'd get up and he'd squirm and get under the table and, you know, do all those things that toddlers do, you know, and that, that annoy everybody in the room. And so, uh, luckily, we were by ourselves. And so we, we finished our meal and everything, and, and we're sitting there, you know, we're trying, trying to get stuff together. And I, I kind of sit there and it's like, where did Evan go? <laughs> it's always a scary question, right? When it gets quiet, you go check if you have toddlers, right? And so I was like, where did Evan go? And I heard this giggle behind me. And so I turn around, and Evan is standing on top of a table dancing in the Mexican restaurant. And I'm just sitting, sitting there thinking, dear Lord, I'm glad we're the only ones here. They're about to kick. Let's get out of here. You know, just like, oh. You know, a lot of times you'll walk around here, and you'll, you'll see him. He won't say anything to you. You know, he'll just, he, he acts all bashful and stuff. He is not bashful, I promise you, he is not. And, and so in this moment, we see the Magi showing up, and they are bringing gifts to a toddler, all right? And, and if you could imagine that scene, you know, these, these Magi, these wise men, I mean, bringing in these nice gifts, and, 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 and they bow down to a toddler, right? A snot-nosed toddler gets these gifts. I mean, you're just thinking, what in the world? Now, before y'all get mad at me, I'm, it's a joke. Jesus was not a snot-nosed toddler, <laughs> But could you imagine being his brother or sister, though? <laughs> Think about that a second. How many times did their mom or dad say, why can't you be more like Jesus? <laughs> I'm just like, I can't do it. Anyway, Matthew chapter 2. Let's, let's read some Bible here real quick. Dear goodness. Matthew chapter 2 is where we see the story of the Magi coming to visit him. We're going to jump in at verse 10. And read this, it says, When they saw the star, they were overjoyed, and coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures and presented them with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And so, as we're looking at the gold, frankincense, and myrrh, like I said a while ago, it actually preaches the gospel of who Jesus is 
and what he came to do. We see Jesus with the gold. We see Jesus as the king. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And this is a present for royalty. They brought him frankincense. And last week we looked at frankincense and we see Jesus as our high priest. The high priest was the the one that would be the go-between between God and man. Jesus is the one that came Uh, to set that relationship right again as high priest. And today we're going to look at myrrh, and we see Jesus in His humanity uh, as the suffering servant or the Lamb of God. And so that's what I want to talk to you about today is is myrrh and Jesus as the Lamb of God. Now, how many of y'all have some myrrh in your house? Anybody have myrrh? I actually got to hold a little bit of myrrh a while ago. Nobody this serves? Besides Christy over here, she, she brought in like gold, frankincense, and myrrh and these little things. I was like, oh, so that's what that actually looks like. But see, what they would do with the, uh, the myrrh is actually the sap from a thorny bush in which I cannot pronounce, so I'm not even going to try. Uh, but you find it in northeast Africa and southwest Asia is where you find this tree. And, and they would, uh, you know, let the sap come out, let it dry, and they would s- scrape it off, and then they would use it for uh, different things. And it does have some health benefits, as I've realized a lot of these do. With myrrh, uh, it actually kills harmful bacteria, parasites, and other microbes. And so you could use it to clean surfaces and stuff, and even airborne uh, bacteria, it'll kill those things. It helps with your oral health, skin sores, and it eases pain and swelling. And so myrrh actually had a, a physical thing that it did, and so it would have been very helpful for them as they were raising a toddler. How I many know bacteria, you know, they come with toddlers. They pick them up from everywhere, and they bring. So myrrh was good for cleaning uh, in those times, and so. But we also see, as we look into the scripture, we see myrrh uh, arrive several different times uh, in in very significant places. And so, for spiritually, myrrh was used in the the temple anointing oils. And so, as they were, uh, you know, dedicating the temple to God and and all that stuff, they would anoint. Uh, in, in the anointing oil, there would be myrrh. In fact, let's go there to Exodus chapter uh, 30 in verse 22. You know, this is the Lord speaking to Moses, and he's you know, setting up all of the stuff that he wants for the temple. And, and as, if, as you read through you know, like, uh, you know, Deuteronomy and Exodus, and you see God giving these instructions, you'll see that they're very detailed. See, our God is a very detailed God. He doesn't do anything by accident. But everything is very purposeful in what he does. And, and as we can see in this, is very symbolic of, of Jesus is the myrrh. So Exodus 30, verse 22, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Take the following fine spices, 500 shekels of liquid myrrh, half as much, that's 25 shekels for those who are doing math, uh, of fragrant cinnamon, 25, 250 shekels, did I say 25? 250 shekels of fragrant uh, calamus, and 500 shekels of cassia, and all according to the, the sanctuary shekel. And a hen of olive oil. Now when I first heard that, I thought a hint of olive oil, you know, if you're cooking and stuff. No, that's a gallon of olive oil right there. That's not a hint, that's a whole gallon. It says, make these into a sacred anointing oil, a fragrant blend, the work of a perfumer. And it will be the sacred anointing oil. Then use it to anoint the tent of meeting, the ark of the covenant law, uh, the table and all of its articles, the lampstand and all of its accessories, the altar of incense, the altar of a burnt offering and all of its utensils, and the basin with its stand. You shall consecrate them so that they may be most holy, and whatever touches them will be holy. So we see that the, the anointing oil was made things holy, or it set them apart for God's use. And, and it had that myrrh, that liquid myrrh in it. It, it goes on in verse 30, it says, Anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them so that they may serve me as priests. And so this myrrh was meant for anointing or making things holy uh, in that. Uh, Another place that we see myrrh show up is actually uh, in the crucifixion of Jesus. It shows up twice, uh, once when he was on the cross and once when he was being buried. In Mark chapter 15... They, they, they've taken Jesus to Golgotha, so they brought Jesus to the place of Golgotha, which means the place of the skull, and they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he didn't take it. And they crucified him, dividing his clothes and cast lots to see what each one would get. <clears throat> and so he's on the cross at this point, and, and they were offering him wine mixed with myrrh, and I'm sure that was to numb some of the pain that they were going to. And I love that Jesus refused it, because one of the things that he wanted to do is feel the full brunt of what was happening to him. 
Because he paid the price for our sin in that moment. He paid the price for our hurts and our pains and all the things that we go through. And he said, I don't want this to be numbed. I want to experience this. So we serve a God that experienced every single hurt and pain that you have experienced and will experience. That was the high priest part of him there that we talked about last week. And so they offered it to him on the cross. In John chapter 19, we see it also in the burial of Jesus. John 19, 38 says, Later, Jesus of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. And he was also accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who, vi- who early had visited Jesus at night. It- it's interesting that the two people that came and got Jesus were like secret disciples. Like they believed, but they, w- they were hiding it from everyone. I don't know what that means, but I don't know. You can take it or leave it. So Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds, and taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with spices, the, the myrrh and aloe, in strips of linen. This was accordance to the Jewish burial customs. And so this was something that was built in to their customs already. And so as the, the Magi brought these gifts, uh, I don't know if in their minds they knew what it represented for uh, the next king of the Jews as they were going to worship. Uh, but it was very symbolic of it. I believe that the Holy Spirit prompted them to bring these particular gifts in this moment because myrrh represents the humanity of Jesus, the side of Him that would suffer and die for us, and we call this Jesus as the Lamb of God. So why would Jesus be referred to as the Lamb of God? It's interesting to me that, you know, that's the... The animal that they used, you know, because, uh, you know, when I think, you know, you think, you know, he came as king of the Jews. You know, that's what his title was that the Magi were looking for, king of the Jews. And so you would think that he would be like the lion, right? You know, something that was was strong and, or, or, you know, something like that. You know, there could be all kinds of things that they could refer to Jesus as. But why lamb? Does anybody have lambs? Does anybody raise sheep in here? Most of us do not. Most of us have seen a sheep like somewhere. Uh, but, but sheep are not the smartest animals in the world. Like you've never paid money to go see the, uh, the trained sheep show at the circus, have you? There's not one. You can't train a sheep. I mean, they're just, they're just dumb, you know. And, and, and they just kind of follow the crowd. And, and, and so why would, they, why would he be named the Lamb of God? And In fact, in John chapter 1, verse 29, we see... Uh, This is right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And John the Baptist saw Jesus one day, and he said this. He said, the next day uh, John saw Jesus coming, and he said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. See, Jesus had just been baptized at this point. I mean, he hadn't really done a whole lot yet. But John is calling him out as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Why would he call him a lamb? Well, see, in Jewish culture, they knew exactly what that meant. The Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. When they heard that, they immediately recognized Jesus, saying, John is calling him the Messiah. So what's the connection between the Lamb and the Messiah? Why would that be a connection at all in this? And so today I want to look at Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of of the world. See, when the people heard that, they knew exactly what John was saying that this is the Messiah. If we go back into the, the book of Exodus, chapter 12, uh, we'll see this connection of, of a lamb and what it meant to the children of Israel, what it, what it meant to the Jews, because this is something that was very, very, very familiar to them. And so uh, the, the scene that we see here in Exodus, chapter 12, is that. Uh, The children of Israel are still in Egypt. They're still slaves. And Moses has came uh, at the prompting of God to go and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And and of course, Pharaoh is not willing to let them go. And so God is bringing plague upon plague upon plague on Egypt to let them know that that God is the, the king of all kings. He is the God of all gods. And he is stronger than any of their gods. And so... Uh, and, and what we see in this scene in, in Exodus chapter 12 is like there, all of the plagues have happened except for the last one. The last one is the death of all the firstborn. 
That's going to be the last plague that comes. And so since Israel is still in Egypt, there had to be a way for them to not lose their firstborn, but all of Egypt to lose their firstborn. And so this thing that, uh, that God came up with this an idea is the Passover lamb. And I want to read this to you in Exodus chapter 12 in verse 1. For the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be the, for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel, on the tenth day of this month, each man should take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with the nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there. Uh, you are to determine the amount of lamb needed accordance to the, what each person will eat. The animal that you choose must be uh, a year old male without defects, and you must take him, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. <clears throat> it says, Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the members of, of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the the sides and the tops of the door frames of the house where they eat the lamb. And so what would happen in this, in this particular plague, when they put the blood on the doorpost of the house, when the death angel came that night, he would pass over that house and nobody would die in that house in that night. And so this became known as Passover. And, and this is one of the, the major uh, festivals that Jews celebrate is the festival of Passover. And so uh, this is also the day that as we go forward, this is the day uh, that they will take in the Passover lamb and they will sacrifice it. And this was the one time of year that the high priest could go into the presence of God in the temple and put the, put the blood of the, uh, the lamb on the mercy seat. And it would atone the sins of the people for a year. All right. And so this became a very significant day for all Jews because this was the day of atonement to where... Uh, their sins would be forgiven for the year. All right? And, and so when John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, they immediately thought of the Passover Lamb, and they immediately knew uh, all of the, uh, uh, all the prophecies about the coming Messiah and how He would take away the sins of the world. And so immediately they thought, John is calling this man the Messiah, the one who is coming to take away the sins of the people. This was an exciting moment for the people of Israel. This stirred up a lot of excitement in that time because they're saying the Messiah is coming. And so why is it that a lamb has to die? What, what, what is the point of that? I mean, why would God set up a system to where, where they would have to kill a lamb every year? Now, this happened more than just once a year. The Day of Atonement was the big one. But, but every day in the temple, morning and night, a lamb was sacrificed. And there was a lot of animals that got killed within this covenant of the old covenant of God. And why is that? Why is it that would somebody have to do such a gruesome thing? Do you remember what the Bible says? It says the wages of sin is death. When sin happens, there must be death to atone for it. When sin happens, there must be a death. And this is what happened in the Old Covenant was, if you sin, then you had to sacrifice one of your animals to atone for that sin. Now, you would probably think, um, think a little bit more about your uh, actions if you knew you were going to have to go kill a lamb every time you did something wrong, right? You know, that, that might kind of factor into some things, like, I only got two left, you know. Like, maybe I ought not do that today, you know what I'm saying? But... But in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, it says, For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. It's the blood that makes atonement for one's life. The reason that the blood had to be applied is so that there would be atonement for sin. All right, has anybody seen any parallels to Jesus yet here? All right, this is where we're going is that Jesus had to shed His blood for atoning for our sin. But see, here's the thing. As we read in he Hebrews chapter 12, we see that the blood of bulls and goats was not good enough to take away the sins. 
We look in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, it says, The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming. The whole reason that God set up the Old Testament was to point towards the Messiah that was coming. All of the things, all of the sacrifices, all of the festivals, all of those things point to Jesus. Sometimes we look at the Jews and like, why can't you see this? Why can't you see that everything that you celebrate, everything that you do, it points to Jesus? One day they'll see it. And one day they will come and make Jesus Christ Lord and Savior in their lives. The Bible promises us that. So the law is only a shadow of good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifice repeated endlessly, year after year, make perfect those who are drawing near to worship. That sacrifice never fully took care of everything. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed and felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are annual reminders of sin. The point that God was making with them is that I want you to sacrifice this because I want you to understand very thoroughly that if there is sin, there has to be death. And it was a reminder of their sin. It said, but those sacrifices are an annual reminder of their sin. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. That's why they had to continuously sacrifice. Therefore, when Christ came into this world, he said, sacrifice an offering you did not desire. See, that wasn't God's ultimate plan. He didn't actually want all of the sacrifice to happen. He said, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my Lord. I have come to do your will. Verse 11, it says, Day after day the priests stand and perform their religious duties. Again and again they offer the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Man, that's good news right there. So we no longer have to go and sacrifice animal after animal because of our sin, because Jesus paid the price for our sin. He was the perfect lamb. Is, do you think there's any parallels between Jesus and the Passover lamb? Oh, let's go look at some. What do you think? Let's go find some. So the Passover lamb was chosen and set apart on the 10th day of the first month, which was Nisan. We read that just a while ago where that was set up. On the 10th day of Nisan, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the fowl of a donkey and was hailed as king of the Jews. We call this the triumphant entry. This was when, when you know, Jesus got on the donkey and, and the disciples, they laid their coats on the ground and, and he rode the donkey into Jerusalem. And they, they waved the palm branches and they said, Hosanna to the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. These were the things that they would say as the Passover lamb was coming in. And they held Jesus as king of the Jews the same time that the Passover lamb was happening at the same time. You can find that in Mark chapter 11 verses 1 through 11. The lamb was to be inspected for four days until the 14th day of the month for any spot or blemish that might disqualify it as a sacrificial lamb. They, they scrutinized every single lamb and it had to be perfect. There couldn't be anything wrong with this lamb. They went as far as looking at the hair follicles. And if there was a white one and a black one that came out of the same follicle, disqualified. I mean, it was a thorough examination that they did on the Passover lamb. And, and, and so do you think they examined Jesus the same way? See, from the time that he walked in from the triumphant entry, he was in the temple, he was teaching, he was in the synagogues. And time and time again, the Jewish leaders came and questioned him and tried to trick him. Time and time again, nobody could find anything wrong with Jesus. They could not find anything wrong. Mark chapter 11 through chapter 14, if you want to go read that. At the appointed time, the Passover lamb was slain by the whole congregation of Israel. Jesus, the Lamb of God, was delivered and publicly killed and crucified on a Roman cross as the Passover lamb was being slaughtered. The same time that they were doing the Passover lamb, Jesus went to the cross for you and me. Same day. See, he carried his cross to Golgotha. They nailed him to the cross and he gave his life in that moment. 
Notice as you read through the Gospels, in that scene, the people were outside. Pilate would come out and say, guys, I don't see anything wrong. I don't see what you see. I don't see any guilt in him. He has done nothing wrong. And what did the crowd shout? Crucify him. They were crucified by the whole congregation of Israel in that moment, just as the Passover lamb did that same day. See, Jesus is our Passover lamb. He is the one. He was the perfect sacrifice. He is the only one that could have perfectly fulfilled the law. And that because he did that, because he was the perfect lamb and that he died in our place, now that as we give our lives to him, as we have that moment of salvation, when we say, God, you are in control of my life now. Forgive me of my sin. In that moment, the sacrifice that he made on the cross applies to you now. The blood of Jesus is applied to your heart. Now God looks at you and he said, this one is perfect. That's good news, right? He looks at us and he doesn't see us in our sin, but he sees the blood of Jesus in our life and he said, that one's mine. I have forgiven him. I see him as righteous, holy. Did you know that's how God sees you, as righteous and holy? How many of you see yourselves as righteous and holy? <laughs> we need to start looking at ourselves in that way because that's the way God looks at us. We're not righteous and holy because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus has done. And that we've applied that blood to our lives, and he's changed us. In Romans 8, I love how this kind of encapsulates this whole idea. It says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. No condemnation. Your sins are forgiven. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. You are set free from the law of of sin and death. You are no longer under that old law of sacrifice and death and all of that stuff. Now you're in a, a place of life and life more abundant. That's what Christ brought into our lives. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. As we live our lives according to the Spirit, as we're led by the Spirit of God, we are partakers in what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross and that we can live free from sin and death in our life. Amen? Amen. Does that mean we'll never sin or never die? That's not what that means. That means we'll never be separated from God ever again. Amen. Nothing can separate us from the presence of God. All right, I got some time. Today, as I wrap up, I want to go into Isaiah chapter 53. I love Isaiah 53. This was the prophet Isaiah. He was looking into the future and prompted by the Holy Spirit. He speaks about the coming Messiah. And I love this because he gives some detail. You know, someone did some research one time about, uh, you know, Jesus filling the, fulfilling the prophecies and he said that, I, I can't remember the exact number, but he said for Jesus to fulfill, I, I think it was like five or eight of the prophecies, it would be like one in 100 trillion chances that one person could do it. Did you know there's over 100 prophecies in the Bible about the coming of Messiah and Jesus fulfilled every single one of them? Amen. Man, you can't deny this stuff. Isaiah 53 is one of these. I love this. It says, Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before, for he grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root from the dry ground. And he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. See, Jesus, he came up and he grew up just like us. He was born as a baby, and he grew up as a child. And, he, and the Bible says that he grew in stature, and he grew in wisdom. That kind of blows my mind because I've always, you know, kind of thought that, you know, when Jesus was born, like, he, had every, he, he already had all that stuff, that he didn't have to 
grow in anything, that he didn't have to learn anything, but he, ha- he had to go through all of that just like us. And he said there was nothing special about him. There was nothing that, that we'd look at him and you, you know how you see the pictures of Jesus, like the old-timey pictures, and he's glowing? Jesus didn't walk around glowing. Like he didn't have an aura about him that he walked around and it was just like, ooh, you know. But he, he grew up just like us. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering, familiar with pain. Like one from whom people would hide their face. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. See, here's the beautiful thing about Jesus growing up. Is that he experienced all of the pain that you've experienced. He's experienced heartache. He's, he's experienced rejection. He's experienced depression. He, he's, he's experienced all of these things. He was faced with all of these things. And so when you are walking through life and you're, and you're living in this pain that you're in now, you know that Jesus is right there with you because He knows what you're going through. And He, he understands. Surely He took <clears throat> upon our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered Him punished by God and stricken by Him and afflicted. But He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on Him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to slaughter. And as a sheep before the shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Do you know that when Jesus was on trial, he never once defended himself. They would ask him, What are you going to say to these accusers? What are you going to say about these accusations? He wouldn't say anything. The only time that he answered someone, he says, he said, they say that you're king of the Jews. Is this true? He says, it is as you say. That's about the only thing that he said in his trial. But he was silent. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of this generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor had any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. Though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the Lord And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. And after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. That means he's going to raise from the dead after that, after he's been in the grave. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death. And was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sins of many, and he made intercession for those transgressors. That is our Jesus. That is the Lamb of God that was slain for us. Centuries before he even walked the earth, Isaiah said those words. Some very detail about his death and what it would accomplish in our lives. So as we're wrapping up, and let's put all this together. As we are looking at myrrh today, myrrh was used as anointing oil, and it was used within burial. See, Jesus was anointed the Lamb of God that was slain from the foundation of the world. Do you understand what that means, that He was slain from the foundation of the world? Before God said, let there be lights, God knew exactly how it all play out. He knew that we would rebel against Him. He knew our sin. He knew those things, and He decided to go ahead and, and create us anyway. And He knew that, that all of this was going to happen and that there would have to be a sacrifice that would be made. And so He predestined Jesus to be the Lamb of God. What does this mean for us? That it means that God knows every single aspect of your life. He knows every decision that you're going to make. He knows every thought that you're going to think. He's made provision for every single one of those. Whether good or bad, He's made provision for you. He sent Jesus to die on the cross that our sins will be forgiven. Even sins that we have not committed yet, those sins are already forgiven by the blood of Jesus. 
We just have to confess to Him and let Him cleanse us from all that unrighteousness. See, that's, this was what the whole thing was set up on. Was that He knew that Jesus would come and give His life so that He could have a relationship with you and me. See, God's ultimate desire for all of this was that He would dwell among His people, that He would have relationship with His people. And Jesus made that possible. Now we can come to God unashamed. We can come boldly into the presence of God and receive the mercy and grace that we need. All because of the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb who was slain. So when John the Baptist looked at him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes the sins of the world. Everybody knew exactly what he was talking about. He said, This is the Messiah. This is the one that we've been waiting for. And so today as we're celebrating Christmas, we're celebrating the birth. We don't usually talk about the death of Jesus at the birth of Jesus, but it all connects. You can't, you can't separate them. We've got to know that we need to be depending on Jesus every single moment of our life. There is not a moment that we don't need Jesus in our life. Now we need to be trusting in Him. Today you may be facing something really hard right now. You're thinking there's no way it's impossible. Well, you serve the God of the impossible. There's nothing that is impossible to God. Trust in Him in this moment. Trust in Him uh, in this season of hurt and pain in your life. In this moment of depression in your life, trust Jesus with this thing. The doctors may tell you you'll never get out of this, but I know the one that paid the price so that healing can come to us. That's what it said in Isaiah 53, right? By His wounds we are healed. See, a lot of people say, well, that was just a spiritual healing. Absolutely, it was a spiritual healing. It brought us our salvation. But I believe that He paid the price for our emotional healing as well. For our mental healing as well. For our physical healing as well. I believe He paid the price for it all. And we need to trust in Him. Amen. Father, we love You. We thank You, God. Thank you that you sent Jesus as the Lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice that fulfilled everything that was set in place. God, and the ultimate thing is that now we get to be in your presence, God, with, and, and be unashamed. God, we ask for your forgiveness, God. Today we repent of our sin. God, we just don't say sorry, but God, we want our lives to be changed. We don't want to go down that path any longer. God, come and change our hearts in this area of our lives. God, I lift up anybody here that has never given their life to you, God, that in this moment that you're drawing them to you through your goodness and your love, God, and that they will grab hold of you and trust you for the rest of their lives. Father, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we get to our feet? We're going to end in a worship song. Today, if you need prayer, where our prayer team is going to be at the front, if you're, if you're in the middle of a struggle right now, don't struggle alone. Come and grab a hand and pray with somebody. Come to the altar. Lift up your hands to God. But ultimately, if you need to give your life to Jesus today, please come today. Today is your day. Let's worship. Every time